A South Korean test missile malfunctioning crash this morning, causing panic in a nearby city as residents thought they were under attack. The test comes in response to North Korea's successful missile launch over Japan. It was Pyongyang's longest ever ballistic launch and the fifth in 10 days. The United States called for an emergency meeting of the United Nations Security Council to discuss the situation that is scheduled for later today. For more on this, let us bring in CBS News contributor and former National Security Advisor for the Trump Administration, retired Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster. Uh, General, good to see you. Hey, Vlad and Emery, good to see you guys. Good morning. So it is interesting that United, uh, the United States called for this uh, emergency security uh, council meeting. Um, what's the hope here? What's the intention of what the U.N. could possibly do? Uh, and would it make any meaningful difference? Yeah, it could make a difference. And I think it's time to go back to really the strategy of maximum pressure to at least test the thesis that Kim Jong-un could be convinced that he's safer without the weapons, his regime is safer without the weapons than he is with them. And that, that pressure kind of dissipated uh, during the, the la la latter years of the Trump administration uh, during the summits that President Trump had with Kim Jong-un. And we've never really done it, Vlad. We've never really tested that thesis to put that pressure on North Korea, a, a country that is very dependent, you know, on on uh, imports for energy, for example, it's hard it's hard to you know, fire a missile without fuel, and uh, and I think that what we what we have to do is try to put pressure, in particular, on China, who controls about ninety five percent of the of the trade with uh, with with North Korea. So I think it's important for there to be international opprobrium about this. I mean, you know, if the Kim family regime gets the most destructive weapons on Earth, who doesn't? Right? There's going to be plenty of of pressure for proliferation. Already, a recent poll in, in South Korea has 55% of the South Korean people in favor of South Korea obtaining a nuclear weapon. So it's the direct threat from North Korea. It's also the threat that North Korea has never met a weapon, you know, that it hasn't tried to sell to somebody, uh, even is trying to sell their nuclear program to Syria before the Israeli Defense Force strikes against that facility in, 2000, in the early 2000s. So I, I think, um, it's really important that the world rally uh, at this point and try to constrain the resources available for the North Korean regime and try to convince Kim Jong-un, hey, you're better off without these weapons because your regime's not going to survive economically uh, you know, without, uh, without you abandoning them. So the Security Council meeting is definitely very interesting. What we have seen before is what we're seeing now, uh, these military drills between South Korea and the United States. I don't know how often they really work in to sort of pressure North Korea to slowing things down. It, 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 are these drills really enough? Yeah, they're, they're really, they're important, right? Because mm. you, you wanna have a high level of readiness. You have to, you have to, Emory, prepare for the worst, right? And you know, it's every time he does one of these tests, how do you know it's a test really? You know, could this really be a strike? And so honing the, the ability to identify early, you know, the, the, the intention of the North Korean regime to strike. And what's important about this year, right? 39 missile, test this year. And what he's doing is he's spreading them out over a, a wide area to make it more and more difficult for our surveillance capabilities uh, to, to be able to, to identify these erector launchers, you know, mo moving out early. And then you have to tie that surveillance capability to a precision strike capability. You have to be able, in missile defense, you know, shoot down some, some arrows, but you have to really be able to kill the archer because you can't have enough missile defense to, to defend against you know, a large scale missile attack. And, and, and really the technology has got to evolve as quickly as we can to be able to, to strike some of these missiles in the boost phase, right? Before they, you know, before they reach the, the high speeds or can be maneuvered to evade missile defenses. So in South Korea, Japan, of course, is, is, is under the gun here as well. You saw the panic associated uh, with this launch that, that, went, uh, that went over Japan. Um, have to really bolster their missile defense capabilities. And I think, you know, Emory, in the future, what we're going to need as well is we're going to need land forces that can deploy rapidly to unexpected locations and then conduct reconnaissance and offensive operations to take out these missile systems. You know, we're talking about North Korea, but, you know, Iran has developed this drone missile strike complex that it is using out of Yemen and attacking United Arab Emirates and attacking Saudi, Saudi Arabia. We saw the strikes that Iran conducted into Iraq against our base in Iraq a couple of years ago. So, you know, this proliferation of long range missile capabilities 
is a big security problem for, you know, for us and, and our allies and partners around the world. Mm -hmm. um, General, big picture. I, uh, back in 2019, when former President Trump met with uh, North Korean's leader, North Korea's leader Kim Jong Un. There were, there were, I think, a lot of people that thought, well, maybe this will be, uh, there will be some historical antecedents here with uh, President Nixon uh, going to China uh, in the early 1970s, which thereby led to a, a, a better relationship with China um, than we had previously had. Uh, the president went to meet with Kim Jong Un to revive these stalled nuclear talks. Nothing's really come of it since, and I wonder. You know, what would it take for the North Koreans either to give up their nuclear program or to at least re-engage with the United States? Why do you think nothing fruitful ever came from those talks? Well, you know, it was worth a shot, Vlad, right? Because I think what it did, it broke a pattern of what had been these bottom-up, really frustrating negotiations with, with North Korea, during which typically we made concession after concession, got a weak agreement, that North Korea then immediately broke so it could extort even more concessions from us, you know, and it locked in the status quo as a new normal. And the status quo now, I think, is, is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. But, the, you know, the reason these fail is we have to be at least open to the possibility that Kim Jong-un doesn't want to give up his nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And I think the only way that we can really respond to that is with a campaign of of maximum pressure. You know, you never know with North Korea, you know, what, what could happen next. You know, there's been predictions for so long, right, that this this state is an impossible state to use the, the scholar Victor Cha's uh, phrase on this, and, and that it's gonna collapse, right, under, under the weight of its own, you know, contradictions, under its economic weakness. You know, North Korea is coming out of these, these major floods uh, you know the the uh, you know the COVID restrictions they've had really constrained what was already a very weak and uh, economy. Yet Kim Jong Un keeps pouring resources that he has available into this nuclear program and into his military. What if what if we could constrain those resources even more tightly? And he faced some real dilemmas. Kim Jong Un is vacillated, right? He's gone back and forth between, hey, I'm going to prioritize the economy. Now I'm going to prioritize the the military, and and you know you're going to have to suffer more. He has this, this juche ideology, is what it's called in the North, where they make deprivation into a virtue, right? Mm. It's a sign of their as a sign of their purity and and, and that you know that, that they're they're there's you know that they they um uh, have no resources available to them and and that the people are are destitute and impoverished. So I, I think you know, how long can can you continue along those those lines? I think another another option in terms of maximum pressure as well. And, and it is is to is to try to poke holes, you know, in in this firewall. I mean, we've seen kind of the the power of being able to you know to to give people alternative means of communication. We're seeing that nascent capability in Iran with you know Elon Musk's Starlink, right? I mean, I think you know this is a gulag state in North Korea. It's a brainwashed population. Over this is really, this is the third generation of the only hereditary communist dictatorship in the world, right? And I think. I think you know, poking holes in that firewall, trying to reach the population is another really important aspect of the strategy we ought to adopt. Uh, General H.R. McMaster, it's always really fascinating talking to you. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks, Emery. Great to be with you.